we praise you for who you are in Jesus' mighty, holy, and perfect name. Amen. All right, we taught this one to you guys last week. Let's sing about the power in the name of Jesus. Tear off the roof, kiss the kings in the house. Just give me to Jesus, I don't care how. And I don't have to wait to get to here. I got a faith without a ceiling. So tear off the roof, cause the king's in the house. Let's lift him up. There's power in the presence, power in the blood, power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the presence, power in the blood, power in the name of Jesus. And he has more in the heavens coming than the camp of the enemy. There's power in the Power in the blood, power in the name of Jesus. Sing this out, I didn't come here. Oh, I didn't come here to hide in the crowd. Right. And I'm pressing through you, I don't care how. Oh, reaching out my hand to get to healing. I got a faith.
because of that power, we can trust in God. Amen. That's right. Let's sing this out together.
let's pray together. Father God, we come to you today in worship and in corporate prayer, not in our own merit, but by the blood, the saving blood of Jesus the Christ. And Father, today I just want to thank you for building this church, not the building that we sit in, but the people of God that sit here today. Some people, Father, are uh, Christians from a young age that have been in church before they were born, and they're still in church, they're still serving you. Some people, Father, have just walked in from for the first time because they saw us from the highway. Some, Father, have been in chains of metal or drugs or alcohol or addictions. And, Father, all of us have something in common, and that is you have freed us from those chains of bondage of sin. You have rescued us and restored us. And, Father, for that, we praise you and worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're, yeah, I like that. I like that spirit. That's good. Um, man, I hope you guys are glad to be here. I'm excited about uh, this next coming week because it's a, kind of a big deal. We've got Good Friday, two services. Hope that you'll come, 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock. And then a week from today, Easter Sunday, uh, we go to three services because it's we're real full around here, and we need more parking, and we need more space in here. So we're going to three services. We're going to hang out at three services. Um, 815, um, 945, and 1115. We hope that you can um, come to one of those. Now you've got more space to invite friends and invite your friends' cars to come and park. Uh, so that's pretty glorious. We know that, honestly, is the most, this is the most cost-effective way uh, to um, kind of manage or steward the blessing that God is giving us, which is new people. And the church is all about God's glory, and it's all about reaching people. So we want to do that. We want to be open to that. So we're going to three services, and um, we're excited about it. I hope you're excited about it, too. Um, hey, one other thing. So we've got uh, two Good Friday services, three uh, Easter services. We actually have an Easter service this afternoon at the Missouri Eastern Correctional Center. We're taking a team of 30 people there, so we're excited about that. Um, we're renting out their gymnasium. We're bringing in our own sound and our band and all that stuff. And uh, we got a couple guys that are going to share a word of testimony. Uh, Stan, you, got, you want to wave, Stan? Everybody, everybody say hi to Stan. Uh, Stan's right there. Stan's going to be bringing a, bringing a word, a uh, message from the word. So really excited about that. And I want us just to take a moment uh, to pray for this afternoon. Uh, going into an environment that... Um, it's really hard to get in and out of with a bunch of gear, and you never know, like, electrically the situation and logistically and all those things. So pray for our choir. Uh, pray for Stan and Ronnie as they'll be bringing a word and some testimony, um, and just pray that God will use it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for an opportunity to share your gospel and to share hope. God, we're here to share hope, and we know that we are all... Uh, sinners in need of your grace, and there is no such thing as too far for you and for your grace. And I pray that message would be so abundantly clear to the men this afternoon. Lord, that you would uh, get a hold of their, their lives and their walk. Lord, not because there's going to be girls there. Uh, Lord, not because the music is hype, but because the message of your gospel penetrates their hearts. And Lord, we ask for that this afternoon, and we also ask for that today. That this wouldn't just be hype, but your message would penetrate our hearts. We pray this in your name. Amen. Several years back, I went on an airboat ride. How many of y'all have been on an airboat ride? 
down in the Florida Everglades. We, I lived down there for, Rebecca and I lived down there for almost four years. I was uh, at, a, at a church there. And one of our last weeks there, we're like, we haven't done this. It's funny, when you live in a tourist area, you don't go do all the touristy stuff. And so we're like, oh, we've only got a few weeks left, so let's live it up. So we got on, on one of those airboat ride things. I think it was called Billy Swamp Safari. I don't even think you can go anymore because uh, we tried to go last spring and it wasn't, wasn't open. So we went on this airboat ride and we had the opportunity of a lifetime. We got to see something that you only see on TV. We got to see a pig get eaten by a crocodile <laughs> live. We were in this airboat, and all these little piggies come up to the edge. And they're all like, they're thirsty. You know, they're thirsty. They have a need. They have a desire. They have a need. And they want it to be met. Okay? So little piggies coming up to the bank. Um, and we're, we're having to go, oh, look at those cute little piggies. And then just right before, about where you guys are, I see this. And it's not an alligator because everything's, it's a crocodile. It's, this is the Florida Everglades, so you never know what's in there. There's stuff from Africa and Asia and India, everywhere you could ever imagine in those Everglades. So you think, oh, those crocodiles. No, there was a full-on, like, crocodile from who knows where. Uh, and he, I just see his nose kind of come up. And that crocodile comes, bam! And you hear all these pigs, wee, 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 wee. They're all freaking out. And that poor little baby piggy is a snack in about 30 seconds. And all the women on the airboat ride were like, oh. And all the guys were like, yeah. That's what we pay for. But get this. Not a minute later, all the pigs, it's pure chaos. They run out. They, they get clear away off the bank. Not a minute later. Guess where the pigs come back? <laughs> They're right back, ready to drink the water. And the book of Judges feels a lot like that. These little piggies that have this need and this desire, and they keep coming back to it, but they don't realize they're walking right into destruction. So we've talked about this process that, that most of us go through when we fall into sin. We go from holy, we're looking for God's best, then we go to Homer, we get sloppy, we get lazy. And after a while with sloppy and lazy, or if you're sloppy and lazy and you lead your kids that way, you take them down a road where they don't even know God, they don't know the ways of God, and now all of a sudden all the truth of God makes them angry. So we've gone from holy to Homer to Hamas. Hamas literally means violent evil against God. The word was introduced in Genesis chapter 6. That's what that word means. Now, we saw in the book of Judges, and we've seen it all throughout Scripture, God provides for people to live within their purpose and their calling. He gives them what they need. This is the cycle that we see. Secondly, the people get sloppy in their faith. They get a little bit homer. They stop exercising their faith. They stop praying. They start listening more to other factors than they listen to God. And in this case, the Israelites were living in the land of Canaan, and they were paying way more attention to all the Canaanites and their gods than they were to Almighty God who saved them. And so they started worshiping Baal. Baal was the supreme god of this new promised land of the Canaanites, they worshipped Baal and they worshipped Asherah. Asherah was the goddess, but she was also the goddess of uh, what you would call uh, all types of sexual deviance. So whatever, anything goes sexually kind of thing. And so the, the Israelites find themselves being drawn away by these very strong and very real desires and addictions that they have because they get sloppy like Homer. And so what happens? God allows the people to suffer because of their poor decisions, one stacked on top of the other, stacked on top of the other. They don't just suffer. They literally become slaves. Every time they do this, they become slaves. Like they were slaves in Egypt. Well, now they're slaves in what should be their own land. And so in, in the, the story we learned last week, this, this Mesopotamian king has taken over. Then what happens? The people finally in their slavery realize, oh my gosh, I'm doing this the wrong way. 
Lord, would you help us? They come to God broken, and they ask the Spirit of God to, to, to work. And so they turn back to God, and God provides. Now, in the book of Judges, the, the book's called Judges because God provided judges to lead the people. This is before kings. And these judges aren't like Supreme Court judges or justices. These judges are more like tribal leaders or military leaders that raise people up and protect their people groups. Something you need to know about these judges, too. These judges are not prophets. They're not priests. They're not like Moses. They're not like Abraham. They're definitely not like Melchizedek. They're not prophets. They're not priests. They're not pastors. They're not even Sunday school teachers. These judges are just simply people that God picks to lead the people to have their own national sovereignty. So we talked about how God raised these people up. They're not perfect. They're not even godly necessarily. Some of them are. Some of them are awful. Um, but God provides these people to give them back their own sovereignty as a nation and their own freedom. Now, this cycle that happens, it's kind of like this piggy cycle, <laughs> you know, the judges. And, and it, it's kind of like a, a picture of my life. It's like a picture of your life, isn't it? Because God makes you and I. And he designs us for a greater purpose. And he has this goal for us to walk with him in relationship. But what happens? Well, we get a little homer. We get a little sloppy. And we find ourselves tempted. We give in to the temptation. The temptation leads us to sin, just like the pigs come back where that crocodile was. We come back to it. Our sin then causes brokenness. It causes a gap between us and God, and we suffer. Now, for those of us that are in Christ, this suffering isn't a horrible thing because the suffering leads us to brokenness and it leads us to repentance, which means we're led to change. And God provides a way back to him by his unlimited grace and his unlimited mercy because God desires that all will come to him. Now, this cycle happens seven times in the book of Judges. They are granted freedom and the reason they're granted freedom is the same reason that you and I are granted spiritual freedom today. We talked about this last week. How did they get their freedom back? First off, they were personally broken. They realized that they were worthless and broken without God, just like I do today. I am worthless and I am broken without God. Here's the good news. God demonstrated his love for me and for you in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet homers, while we were yet little piggies coming back to the water, Christ died for us. We are broken. Speaking of broken, does anyone enjoy going to the mechanic? Anyone here? It's hard. Any of you, any of you that work in this auto industry, especially customer service and repair, no one's happy to see you. I hate to tell you that. When we come and see you, we're angry. And sometimes we take that anger out on you. And I just want to apologize on behalf of everyone at Connect Church <laughs> that that is what we do, especially when we get the bill. I hate going to the mechanic. I never, hey, honey, what do you want to do today? Would, who wants to go to the mechanic? <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. Only an insane person would say that. So when I go to the mechanic, I go for routine maintenance. What happens when you go to the mechanic for routine maintenance, even an oil change? They have a list of all other kinds of stuff that's wrong, don't they? And you need to fix this, and you need to fix that, and you're coming up on this, and you need to fix that. They tell you when you go to get ex your car examined, they tell you all the other things that are wrong with you as well, your car, and maybe you. <laughs> if they start doing that, I don't know what else to say. If it's a check engine light, it's always, almost always an expensive fix. And if, your car, if you're going to the mechanic because your car's not working, you know that's going to be a four-figure expense. No one's excited about that. It costs something to repair brokenness. Every single time. I even go to Jiffy Lube and I'm reminded how much it costs, how much an oil change even costs today. It costs something to repair brokenness. How much more did it cost God? to send his only son to forgive you of all of your sins. All of your little piggy sins, all of your Homer sins, all of your mega sins. 
the small ones, the big ones, and everything in between. Jesus died for all of it. God opened up his wallet for you through his only son to fix you and I. And we need to realize it. That's the first thing. Realize you're broken. Second, we need the spirit of God. I love what the prophet Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 36. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God gives us a new heart. I drive a car that's got 200 plus thousand miles on it, but I drive it with confidence because when I bought it, I bought it from a mechanic and he put a brand new engine in it. So I'm going to get another 200,000 out of that baby. You know what I'm saying? How much more when God gives you a new heart are you able to accomplish? How much more grace are you given? And how much more can you live out the purpose God has for you? So God gives us a new heart, and that's how this happens. So we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to be in Judges chapter 3, starting in verse 12. And this story is a doozy. This one is fun. If I was living in this time, I would say not fun. But I think this story is really fun. Judges chapter 3, verse 12. Now, um, someone very generously donated for us to have a nice Bible in, underneath every single one of our chairs. And if you would like to read along physically, I believe it's page 189 in your Bible, if you want to physically read along. Um, Judges chapter 3, verse 12, the words will also be up here on the screen. It says this, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of the Palms. It says that the people did what was evil. They went back into their cycle. What does evil mean here? Well, we can learn what evil means just by going back a few verses. In Judges 3, verse 7, it says, what was the evil? The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. What did they do? They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asheroth. So what was evil? They went from Homer to Hamas. They, they forgot God's goodness. They forgot God's provision. They forgot all the great things God did. And then they began to worship other gods. So they went from Homer, a little bit sloppy, a little bit forgetful, to Hamas. And God is loaded with grace and mercy. But he is not pleased. And God is intolerant of us living in spiritual darkness when we're his. So now what's going to happen are these three um, nations are going to take over the Israelites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Amalekites. They're not just going to take them over and live with them. They're taking them over as slaves. They go from Homer to Hamas. You know what God says? All right, that's what you want. Here you go. That's what you want. Here you go. You know what I learned from that? I learned that you eventually become a slave to the sin that you indulge in. Every one of you. The sin that you indulge in, that you keep going back, you keep going back, you keep going back, you keep going back, you become a slave to it. Here the Israelites are literally becoming slaves, but you and I spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and even physically can become slaves to the sins that we indulge in. Now, who are these people? The Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Amalekites. We're going full circle on this. Let me give you the history of these three groups. They were three nations that started holy, that went to Homer, and became Hamas, and they stayed there. Who are the Moabites? The Moabites are descendants of Moab. You know who Moab was? The grandson of Lot. How was Moab born? Well, we know the story of Lot. He moved to Sodom. He became a homer. He blended in with the wicked culture there. And he was still kind of a follower of God. He even became a politician. But listen, what he did was he put his faith in a box. He kept his faith to himself. He didn't share it with his family. He didn't share it with his kids. But he became this politician in the city of Sodom. God comes to save Lot Lot has been raising his kids in this culture. 
And so these kids are completely depraved of knowing what is right and wrong. So God spares Lot when God destroys and zaps Sodom. He saves the daughters. Remember how Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt? He saves some of Lot's family. The daughters survive. You know what happens in the next episode in the family of Lot? Lot's daughters are so misled by that old culture that they get Lot drunk. And Lot has sex with both of his daughters and he gets them both pregnant. That's how messed up that is. That's how Moab was born. Moab is the son of Lot's older daughter. What about the Ammonites? Ammon was also a grandson of Lot. Ammon was the son of Lot's younger daughter. So this is like the fruit, the long-term fruit of going from holy to Homer to Hamas. These groups of people should have been gods. But through ungodly living and ungodly parenting, an entire nation, two entire nations against God are created. What about the Amalekites? The Amalekites are descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. You guys remember Jacob and Esau? Jacob was the hairy guy. Jacob was kind of the, the charming guy. And Jacob was mom's favorite. Esau was dad's favorite. So Esau, though, was definitely a homer. You know how I know he was a homer? Because he literally traded his birthright, his firstborn rights, to his brother for a bowl of stew. Did you guys get that? I mean, how hungry is this guy? I mean, I know sometimes we eat things we shouldn't when we're starving and we're at QT. <laughs> I mean, we might go all the way and order that double bacon whatever at Wendy's. But what Esau has done in his hunger is he's literally given away the rights of his firstborn, the firstborn uh, privileges. He was totally Homer. So, so Jacob and Esau, and, all the, and, and Esau has all this family. All the Amalekites, that, that branch off of Esau's family, they hate Jacob's family. They seek to take their land, kill their people, destroy their message. As a matter of fact, right after the Israelites cross um, the river, the Red Sea, they try to do everything they can to kill uh, the Israelites, the Amalekites do. So these were the nations that took over the Israelites because the Israelites had taken their eyes off God. And I believe as you go through page one of scripture all the way to the very end, we see this pattern. We see that there is a fine line between a sloppy faith and a holy war. We see this in Lot's family. We see this in the descendants of Esau. And all we have to do is go another generation further. But let's fast forward to 2024 today. In America, a lot of the same demons are still at work and they still exist. Even though people have died and generations have died, the same demons that haunt the Israelites then haunt you and I today. There are demons of idolatry, of materialism, of adultery, of sexuality, of child sacrifice, of trafficking, of blasphemy, how about this one? Selfishness. Selfishness. It might be a new day, but we've got a lot of the same demons. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded and watch. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around as a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. The devil is like a lion. What does a lion do when he attacks? Does he scream and start running like half a mile away? No, he creeps up on you. And what does he do when a lion creeps up? He goes for the throat, man. He wants to take your blood, suck all, get all that blood spilled, and he wants to break your neck. He wants to destroy your mobility. Spiritually, the enemy wants to take your blood, and he wants to immobilize you. That's what he wants to do. That's why the blood of Jesus is so profound. Talk about the crocodile eating the wild boar. Same kind of thing. The crocodile doesn't say, hey, guys, I'm coming. He sneaks up. He goes for the throat. He does that death twirly thing, and he immobilizes. And that's what the devil wants sin to do to you and to do to your marriage and to do your ability to serve God for a greater purpose. That's what he wants to do. 
So we have a turning point, Judges 3.15. It says this. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. How many lefties we got in the room today? Hey, this is your message. There is about 15 of you in about a room of 300-something people. There is uh, 15 or so of you. Keep that in the back of your mind. Ehud is a lefty. But how does, how does this thing go down? How, how, how does God begin to right the ship here with the Israelites? Well, personal brokenness in the spirit of God jumpstarts God's rescue plan. And God uses this guy Ehud, this lefty. You know why? Because God always chooses to use people to help people. He always does. One of the things that I've said several times at church is, you might be the closest thing to Jesus that people are going to encounter this week. God, why don't you do something for this person? Why don't you do something for this person? God's like, yep, I made you. Why don't you put somebody in their life to get a message, a truth, a comforting word? Yep, I did. I made you. God wants to use people, and you might play that role. That might be you. So here we are, Judges 3, 16 through 30. We're going to read this whole narrative together right now. So get your reading glasses ready to go. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Eglon had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt, the handle of the sword, also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade. For he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Great reading here. <laughs> then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came. <laughs> and, when, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. <laughs> And they waited <laughs> till they were embarrassed. Eglon must have had a lot of burritos that night. <laughs> they waited a long time. And they said, hold your breath. <laughs> but when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay that Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Syrah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 40 years. Something you've got to understand about Moab and the Amalekites and the Ammonites is They've got all the heavy armor and the chariots. 
And the people, we're going to learn later on in Judges that, that the Israelites, man, they use all these cruel tools like an ox goad and the jaw of an ox and, and sticks and whatever they can make together by their hand. But the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Amalekites, they've got more sophisticated weaponry. And so Ehud's going to have to be clever about this. He knows that Eglon is a glutton and that he's cocky. And so he knows this might be the way that I can take down this nation. So Ehud, the lefty, straps an 18-inch sword to his right side. Very profound. The reason it's profound is because the guards and all the TSA and all the security, they would have not checked his right thigh. They would have checked his left. Because everyone wore their swords and their daggers on the left. How amazing is that? God using a lefty. There's hope for you. I know you got to like wrangle just to write stuff down. You're just, you know. There is hope for even the lefties out there. After the guards checked his left side, they allow Ehud to confidently walk into the palace and pretty much just kiss up to Eglon. Oh, I love you. You're so great. We look forward to being a part because, I mean, this is war here. So there's some deception and things like that. So this, this large, gluttonous, prideful man is really enjoying this representative of the children of Israel, the children of Almighty God. It really is boosting his ego. And he convinces the king for them just to have a little bit of alone time to to talk in this private upper room. And it's here that we have the Clint Eastwood, John Wayne gladiator phrase, I have a message for you from God. How cool is that? We got to make a movie out of this one. (laughs) So here we have King Eglon in his greatness of stature. And all of his pride. Unfortunately for Eglon, he chose the inner room, which uh, many think, many scholars think that he was actually near the, the, the restroom. And so he stabs him, and his the size of his body absorbs the entire dagger. And he is just laying there, bleeding out, dying in the bathroom. After some time, the the guards want to give Eglon a little bit of time because when you really got to go, you just need time and privacy. Amen? So they they just thank you, Jaime. And so they're just trying to honor their king by giving him a lot of time and a lot. There are no exhaust fans back then, people, okay? A lot of time and a lot of space. But finally, they realize, man, this is not good. And they find him dead. During that time, while they are waiting, Ehud is making his escape, and he's setting up his plan. I don't know how long it was, but it gave him enough time to run and get the troops ready. Now, there's some amazing conclusions that I want to give you from this message, and then we'll wrap things up. The first one is this. Our wickedness holds us back and impacts us. You might not see it. Your wickedness, and I'll even add this word, pride. Your pride holds you back. And you don't even see it because in our immediate culture, we value uh, pride in putting out a lot of strength. <clears throat> but the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Amalekites, their whole nation was born on this. Bitterness against God. That's how this happened. Wickedness over time shaped nations, which then would torment God's people. Another person that was wicked and prideful was Eglon. And a phrase... I don't know why this phrase is in the Bible where it says, the dung came out. (laughs) But it got my attention when I was reading. And you know what I think? Just plain honest with you. Eglon was full of crap. (laughs) And if you're full of crap, you're going to get found out on this side of eternity or the other. 
God has a way of taking your pride and turning it into poop. <laughs> it's, it's real. I know it's funny, but it's real. And we might have some of y'all in this room right now that are full of it. And you're in denial about it. And you've got sin in your life. And you're covering it up. And you're real clever. And maybe you've been a part of church for a long time, so you know how to play the game. God's not impressed. So today might be a day to humble yourself. The second, this story is eventful, but the most important part is the real turnaround. What's the turnaround? The people of Israel cried out to the Lord. The Lord raised up for them a deliverer. They cried out in personal brokenness. And they cried out for the spirit of God. And that's what you and I are called to do so that we don't get puffed up with pride. Lord, I need you. Lord, please break me of the things that are hurting my relationship. Another fact, I'll go back to slide 39. Sorry about that, Greg. Another one is this. We've got an election season coming up. Here's, here's something that is refreshing to all of us where we can really sing that song. I trust in God, my Savior, even in November. You know, you can. <laughs> you can do it. God's grace in this story was strong enough to counteract 18 years of godless pagan rule in government and policies. God did it. God can do that. God can turn things around. And I know, we all want a king, we all want a judge, we all want a this, we all want a that, but we have to. And I'm all for politics, I'm all for voting. We're not going to talk about that up here, but I'm all for it. I think you should. But I also think that our ultimate hope is going to be in God and not in all the other things. So there you have it. Today, God has a turnaround for you. Personal brokenness and the spirit of God. And God's asking, he's opening up the door for you to come to him, broken and humble. And for you, that broken and humble, it might look different than it does for another person. It might look like confession to the Lord. It might look like confession to another person. It might look like being honest with someone. It might look like from this point on, being real and not being fake. I don't know what that looks like for you, but God's spirit will reveal it if you are willing to hear from him. And I want to give you one more amazing message out of this. It's this. God chooses people to set people free. God chooses people to set people free. You might be the closest thing to Jesus that someone is going to come in contact with. And this next week, we've got Good Friday, we've got Easter. We have opportunities for you to be that person, to invite someone to an Easter service, to share the message of Jesus with somebody. That could be you. You could be that person. God usually doesn't just do right things in the sky for people. He puts you in their path. There's a man that was a pastor um, in this region for, I mean, decades. His name was Bob Winter. And uh, I knew Bob when I was a little kid. Um, he was like an evangelist, and he pastored at some local churches. And I was probably five or six years old when I met Bob Winter. And when I was five or six, I was like, that's just some old guy, and I don't really want to sit still in church, honestly. But I did know Bob Winter, and Bob Winter was a friend of our family. And in 2015, I sat down in a meeting, and I sat right across from this old guy. And he said, hi, my name's Bob Winter. And I don't know how I remembered him, but I did. And I told him what we were doing, starting a new church. And Bob Winter, a pastor, an evangelist, he said, for 40 years, I've prayed for God to put a living church off of 141 on the south side of Fenton. For 40 years, I prayed for this. And I think that you might be a part of my answered prayer. You know, there, there's a church here, and they, they had some good years. But recently, um, that baptism was probably just used to wash things, dishes or whatever. People weren't getting in that baptistry. People are doing that here. And it's not because of me. It's because of God's plan. And before I was ever born, because I was probably about 34 at the time, he began praying six years before I was born. I just think, God, thank you for letting me be a part of that. 
And God wants you to be a part of something so much bigger. Don't discount what he can do in your life. He uses people to transform people. Would you bow your heads? As the band comes up, I just want you to think about your own personal brokenness. Um, Think about the uniqueness of how God weaves this story and how real and practical it is. But also how God has a plan to use you for a greater purpose. And some of you in this room are settling. You're settling for what you know. You're settling for what's comfortable. And I want God to do whatever God has to do to disrupt that. I don't want you to be comfortable in your Christianity. I want you to be joyful and inspired and excited to tell others and excited to serve and excited to spend time with the Lord. And I know that's what the Lord wants for you today. So as we sing these next couple songs, some of you might need to come up and pray with prayer partners. You might want to kneel where you are. You might want to do some business with God and say, Lord, God, I've been full of crap. And I need you, I need you to clean up my spirit. The emotions are real right now because I know it's true in this room. Some of you need to say, God, I am broken before you and I need you to change me. And some of you need to pray, God, send me to share your message wherever you are. Let's go all in for him right now. There's a sling in my voice and a stone in my praise. It's pushing back when the darkest weapons form. There's a power on my lips that even death can defy. When the name of our God is lifted high, because there is resurrection power. Sing the name of Jesus with his election power. We raise a mighty song. Come and let your praise get loud. Make that empty breathe, breeze out. There is resurrection power in his name. There are days I have seen filled with heartache. 
morning, you can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, for some of you, uh, you want to still come up and pray. Prayer partners will remain up here through the end of our service and even between the services. They'll be here for a little bit. Uh, if you filled out a connection card, if there's something that you want us to know about what you're going through, you have a prayer request, you've decided to follow Jesus, you want to get baptized, uh, whatever it might be, we want to help you with that. So fill that connection card out. I'm going to lead us in a, in a word of prayer. And after I pray, we'll collect the connection cards. We'll also collect our giving. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. And God, you are so gracious to us. God, I pray that you would help us with the power of your Holy Spirit to resist these demons of idolatry and selfishness and immorality and impurity and materialism and slanderousness. Lord, help us to reject these spirits that, that were very present on the earth um, in the Old Testament but are very present today. Lord, help us to, to remain humble and broken before you. And Lord, help us to live with the power of your spirit. God, I pray that if anyone here needs to make a decision for you, that they would make that decision and you would help them to remain strong in that decision as they leave this place. We pray you would be honored as we give as well because you gave it all for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. The offering uh, are on the buckets are on the side. We'll pass those to the middle. While we collect offering and connection cards, let's watch our wrap-up video.